Every year, over 600,000 people are reported missing in the United States. Luckily, the majority of these cases are quickly solved. However, there are always a select few that go unsolved for years, some even remaining unsolved for decades, with the families of those who are missing never able to get closure on what happened to their loved ones. Today, we'll be looking at four of the most bizarre cases that I've come across. I'll try my best to go over all of the details, facts, and theories about these disappearances. However, I'm certain to miss some things. If there are any details you'd like to share or theories you may have about these missing people, I encourage you to share them in the comments of this video. Further discussion and attention to these cases can only aid in solving them. Viewer discretion is advised. The first of our missing person cases is that of Kahira Frasse. Her disappearance is the most recent that will be featured on this list. She was last seen on February 3rd, 2023 in Beaumont, California. She was eight months pregnant at the time and vanished in rather peculiar circumstances. The day of her disappearance, Kahira's mother, Kara, had a relaxing day planned out. The pair went to the gym for what Kara described as a spa day, and then the two ended their evening by running some important baby-related errands. At the the time of her disappearance, they were on the way to Kahira's grandmother's house for a visit, but on the way, she said that she was hungry, so they stopped at Jack in the Box for a quick meal. The restaurant is located at 89 Beaumont Avenue in Beaumont, California. While waiting in the drive-thru, Kahira suddenly opened the door and stepped out of the car, saying that she needed some fresh air. She brought her Bible with her and walked to the front of the drive-thru. According to Kara, her husband, who was driving at the time, pulled forward and looked at her. She was still standing there, so he backed the car up, paid for the food, and when he pulled back forward, she was gone. The last time that they saw her was when she was standing at the end of the drive-thru. She literally disappeared in minutes. Kara and her husband were immediately concerned and circled around to the front of the restaurant to look for Kahira. They searched the complex's parking lot and she was nowhere to be found, so they reported her missing to the police immediately. She was last seen at 10.39 p.m. Interestingly, she had left her purse in the car. It remains unclear whether or not she took her phone with her because it was not found in the car, but her her family believed that she left it behind and it was simply misplaced. However, the photo that was being used on Kahira's missing persons flyer was taken the very night she disappeared on her phone. It remains unclear how that photo would be obtained if not from the phone itself, although it's possible she could have uploaded the photo to a Snapchat or Instagram story and it was taken from there, but the details behind this remain unclear. The businesses within the complex all had security cameras, including the Jack in the Box that they were at. Unfortunately, none of the footage was pulled for evidence until nearly a month after her disappearance, at which point it had all been recorded over, rendering it useless as evidence for this case. As of now, the only available footage of Kahira from that night was taken from the nearby Mojave River Academy, a school that shares a parking lot with Jack in the Box. The footage shows Kahira wearing gray sweatpants, a black sweatshirt, a hood, a black shawl, and black slip-on shoes. She's walking south across the the parking lot away from the jack-in-the-box. It's unclear where she could have been walking to as there's nothing but a grassy hill and open highway on the other side of the building that she was walking towards. During searches for Kahira, investigators searched along Highway 79 using drones, dogs, helicopters, and planes. Local hospitals, homeless shelters, and mental health facilities have all been contacted as well in order to get a lead on where Kahira may have gone. However, no leads have turned up anything to her whereabouts. Since her disappearance, it's been stated that Kahira had been upset when she exited the car that February night. But what she was upset about, no one knows. Her mother believes she had been suffering a mental health emergency and that she had subsequently been abducted and now is being held somewhere after exiting the car. However, police say that there's no evidence that she was abducted. Husbands and boyfriends are often the prime suspects when women go missing. As such, the father of her son has also been a subject of interest for many. However, he's allegedly been very compliant with law enforcement and is not considered a suspect in the case because of this. In the months following Kahira's disappearance, her family raised money on GoFundMe and promised $100,000 as a reward to anyone who could give them information. However, this offer had an expiration date, and recently the family has come under scrutiny from those on social media, particularly due to a post from her brother, Jamel J.J. Frasse. 
The post read, money won't keep my sister's heart pumping. Money won't help Kahira where she is. One thing we use the money for is to incentivize whoever has her to let us know that she's safe. You don't know what you're talking about. You want a story out of this. I'm telling you to leave my family alone and stop speaking on the situation. You're reading the press release and other information you can get on the internet. I know what happened. I damn sure won't explain that to you. Interestingly, JJ also appears to have filed for an LLC eight months after Kahira's disappearance. You can see in the documentation that Kahira herself is listed as a manager of this business, but how can that be when she had been missing for eight months at the time this LLC was formed? The business has no online presence and the address listed is for a private mail aggregation service, meaning that they have no physical location as well. This is not JJ's only company. Looking deeper, we can find House of Refuge Clean Slate Ministries, which is a nonprofit that, again, has no online presence and the address listed appears to be for a UPS mailbox. When looking up businesses with similar names, I found multiple websites that appear to be religious in nature, and one specific website for House of Refuge Ministries. According to their own website, they're a unique ministry which seeks to address the spiritual, emotional, and mental needs of women, men, and children experiencing various types of abuse. Now, I must clarify that there's no evidence that this is related directly to Kyra's case. However, I feel it's a very interesting detail to add to this story. There's currently a a Facebook group with over 1,000 members dedicated to solving this case. They still post frequently as of the creation of this video. Assuming the best, Kahira would be 24 this year, and her son would be just over one year old. On April 11th, 2001, Branson Perry was at his father's house at 304 West Oak Street in Skidmore, Missouri with his friend Jenna. His parents had recently divorced and he lived with his father, Bob, who was about to return home after a hospital stay. Branson and Jenna were cleaning the house in preparation for Bob's return and two workers were outside fixing Bob's car. Around 3 p.m., Branson told Jenna he was going to the shed to put away some jumper cables. The shed was merely 50 feet from the home, but he never returned and hasn't been seen since. Some sources claim that he told his friend Jenna that he would be going out for a while as well, which could help explain his absence, at least briefly. On April 12th, Branson's grandmother, Joanne, came by and found the door unlocked with no one home. She repeatedly called the house phone, but got no response. She then contacted Branson's mother, Rebecca Clino, who also hadn't heard from him. Bob was discharged on April 17th and, along with Clino, filed a missing persons report the same day, nearly a full week after Branson's disappearance. The police searched a 15-mile radius but found no trace of Branson. The jumper cables were not found in the shed upon initial searches by law enforcement. However, they were just inside the door of the shed when authorities searched a second time two weeks later. About a month after Branson's disappearance, Jenna admitted to the police that the pair had been experimenting with drugs, particularly marijuana and amphetamines. Bob Perry believed that Branson might have hitchhiked to Kansas to meet friends. However, there's no evidence to support this theory, and it's unlikely that Branson decided to run away from his family because authorities authorities kept a close eye on his bank account. The account had money in it that remained completely untouched. In 2003, police investigated Jack Wayne Rogers, a 59-year-old Boy Scout leader and Presbyterian minister. Rogers was under arrest for a truly heinous crime involving a makeshift gender reassignment surgery in Colombia in which he removed a transgender woman's genitals with absolutely no medical license or training to do so. He was questioned about Branson's case during his arrest. As police were searching his belongings, they found abhorrent material on his computer, as well as evidence of many comments on message boards. One of these comments in particular caught law enforcement's attention because he had an incredibly detailed story in which he picked up a man resembling Branson as a hitchhiker and proceeded to rape, torture, mutilate, and murder him before dumping his remains somewhere in the Ozark Mountains. However, when questioned about this story, he stated that he made it all up. Upon hearing about Branson's Branson's case, he simply fabricated the entire story as part of a sick and twisted fantasy that he enjoyed. Among his possessions was a turtle shell necklace that resembled a necklace owned by Branson. Another possible 
theory involves a visit that Branson had made to one of his neighbor's homes four days prior to his disappearance. The man he had visited was named Jason Bierman. During that visit, Branson was non-consensually drugged at some point, leading him to dance around naked, shave his pubic hair, and have sex with Bierman. Bob Perry had known about this encounter, and it was reported that he believed his son was completely taken advantage of during that encounter. The authorities in charge of this case have also come up with their own theory. Lead investigator Steve Whitman is quite positive that this case involves foul play related to drugs. Branson was known to have had tachycardia, making the likelihood of a drug-related death much higher. In rumors and anonymous tips over the years, a particular house was mentioned multiple times. This house was situated on a gravel road about a mile east of Quitman, a small unincorporated town about five miles north of Skidmore, and it was known to be a popular place to buy drugs. In fact, witnesses at the time gave statements to investigators that placed Perry at the house after he'd left his home in Skidmore, meaning that this could potentially be the last time he was seen alive. Sometime between April 13th and 14th, the drug house burnt to the ground, possibly destroying evidence. Darren White, the deputy on duty at the time of the fire, said that by the time we got the call and got there, there was absolutely nothing left. It had burned to the ground. He also stated that the best theory is that the house is where he was actually murdered, and that ultimately, of course, when the house was destroyed by fire, any possible evidence that might have been there would have been destroyed as well. Sadly, Branson's father Bob passed away in 2004. His mother Rebecca wrote this blog post before her passing in 2011. The events of the day are very sketchy to me and often make no sense. I don't have a timeline of when they occurred, only sporadic comments that were made. At one point, the friend saw Branson run into the kitchen and take something out of one of the cabinets, then run out the back door. When he returned, she said he wouldn't tell her what he was doing and acted like nothing happened. Later, she said she had taken a shower, and when she came out of the bathroom, she saw one of the men that were working on the car going through the cabinets in the kitchen. She said she asked him what he was looking for, and he told her nothing, and went back outside. Then, at approximately 3 p.m., she had been upstairs when she heard the front porch door shut. She looked out the window and saw Branson. She asked him where he was going, and he told her he was going to put the jumper cables in the storage shed, and he'd be right back. She never saw him again. The men that had been working on the car, just in front of the shed, claimed to have never seen him as well. No one saw him. Branson left behind no clues, and his disappearance remains a mystery. In 2009, police received a tip that Branson's body Body might be buried at an excavation site, but a thorough search turned up nothing. Recently, on May 16th, 2024, the FBI was in Quitman to investigate a lead by searching a well that two separate people had identified as the location of Branson's remains. When law enforcement searched the site, there were no remains to be found. However, the earth appeared disturbed, leading some to believe that the remains had been moved just before the well was due to be searched. Brandon Swanson was last seen the night of May 14, 2008. He was 19 at the time and a student at Minnesota West Community and Technical College in Canby. The night of his disappearance, Brandon started his evening at a house in Lind, Minnesota, rented by several friends. He was at this small gathering of five people, described as a get-together of a few friends. He consumed an unknown amount of alcohol. One eyewitness stated that the gathering was very low-key, and Brandon was not visibly intoxicated. Sometime between 10.30 and 11, he left the gathering alone and drove to another friend's house in Canby to say goodbye to a classmate who was moving away the next day. His friends again said that he had been drinking, but he wasn't drinking enough to be overly intoxicated. At the house party in Canby, it was reported that he had an additional shot of whiskey and left at some point between midnight and 12.30. He was headed for his home in Marshall and was driving his green Chevy Lumina. Highway 68 is a two-lane highway that is a direct route southeast from Canby to Marshall. Brandon had driven it many times as this was the most direct and shortest route for him to get from home to school. However, he doesn't appear to have taken Highway 68 to get home. Instead, it appears that he was driving on gravel roads northeast of the highway. It's believed he was on these gravel roads to avoid detection by law enforcement and a possible DUI charge. These gravel roads do 
not parallel the highway directly. They're at about a 45 degree angle to the highway, so he would have had to make multiple turns in a stair-step fashion to follow the highway's relative path. It's known that he eventually ended up driving west, down a back road for a mile. This was a simple gravel field road between two large fields. In Google Maps, this road is still on the map, as a continuation of 110th Street. The road he was on takes a sharp left turn, and it's very possible that he was distracted, tired, or simply not knowing the roads, he just went straight ahead to the west. He was attempting to turn south back onto a gravel road when he missed the field approach and went into the ditch at low speeds. The ditch bank was shallow but steep, and the frame of the car became hung up so he was not able to back out or go forward. This occurred at approximately 1.15 a.m. There was no damage to the car and no evidence of injury inside the vehicle. At this point, Brandon attempted to contact two or three of his friends by cell phone, but was unable to reach them. So he called his parents for assistance at 1.54 a.m. Brandon said that he was in a ditch between Marshall and Lind and directed his parents there. There were several calls placed between Brandon and his parents between 1.54 and 217. During one call, he states he's in the left side of the road, just off of Highway 23. During this time, Brandon's parents searched for him in their own car, but were unable to find him. There's been a lot of speculation online as to why Brandon was so disoriented about his location, but it's likely that his disorientation was due to a combination of factors, including fatigue, at least a mild intoxication, unfamiliar back roads, the fact that all the intersections look relatively relatively alike and simply being distracted due to the events of the night, as he was out having fun and may not have been focusing on the road. It's possible that any and all of these factors could have contributed to him not knowing exactly where he was. However, it is difficult to explain how he came to the conclusion that he was near Lind. It would have been a very dark night with little to no landmarks to base this claim off of, as the landscape in the surrounding area consists of a grid-like pattern of monotonous fields. At 2.17 a.m., Brandon's mother called him. He was clearly becoming impatient and told her that he's gonna walk to Lind. He directed his parents to meet him at a popular nightclub in the town. Despite being legally blind in one eye from birth, it's reported that Brandon inexplicably left his glasses behind in the car. At some point in this conversation, Brandon's mother begins to feel ill and is taken back to their home in Marshall. Brandon's father drops her off and begins the trip back to Lind, to the tavern. At 2.23 a.m., Brandon and his father begin a 47 minute long phone call. During this call, Brandon indicates that he was walking along a gravel road away from Marshall towards Lind. At some point, he leaves the road and travels through the fields instead because he believed it was going to be faster than following the road. He further stated that he had encountered two fence lines, saying, another damn fence and noted that he could hear water nearby. Shortly after, Brandon exclaims, Oh shit! His father believes he hears Brandon's foot slipping, and Brandon stops responding. This was at 3.10 a.m. His father called out multiple times, and was never able to contact Brandon again, despite multiple repeated attempts to call him. Brandon's father continued to look for him throughout the night. At 6.30 a.m., his parents contacted the Lyon County Sheriff's Office to report him missing. At first, the police wouldn't search for Brandon. It was reported that the local police told Brandon's parents that it wasn't all that unusual for a young man his age to stay out all night, even adding that it's his right to be missing. The search for Brandon did eventually begin, and police discovered something interesting with Brandon's cell phone records. He had said that he thought he was near the town of Lynn that night. However, cell phone records actually put him near the town of Porter. Sure enough, that area is where his car was located in a ditch near Taunton. The car showed no obvious signs of foul play, and the keys were missing. During the search, police used search dogs who ended up picking up Brandon's scent on a trail near Yellow Medicine River, and also in a part of the river causing police to think that maybe Brandon walked through the water at some point during the night. It's reported that the search dogs also picked up the scent of human remains near Mud Creek, but nothing was found. They also followed his scent to a nearby piece of farm equipment, but that's where police had to stop searching, because in order to search on private property, they needed permission from the landowners, which the landowners were not willing to give. Many cattle farmers in the area didn't want police search dogs on their land, 
land. There were many unmarked cisterns and wells in the area, and authorities have considered the possibility that Brandon could have fallen into one. Additionally, it was just under 40 degrees that night, with a breeze of 6 to 9 miles per hour, so it's definitely possible that Brandon succumbed to hypothermia, especially if he had fallen into the nearby river as theorized. Despite the fact that he had been drinking that night, his parents were adamant that their son sounded perfectly lucid, though he seemed alarmed during their phone call. Within the last two years, authorities have received new information about the night Brandon went missing in the events leading up to his disappearance, including third-hand claims that Brandon had gotten into an argument with someone around the time he was last seen. Though, this tip hasn't led to any new suspects. As of now, there's truly no real evidence that supports his disappearance being a result of foul play. It seems the most likely reason for Brandon's disappearance is that he fell in a nearby river, possibly drowning within the river, or if he made it out, it's likely that he would have succumbed to hypothermia after being drenched in freezing water. From there, it's entirely possible that he died from exposure on a farmer's land, and that that farmer has never consented to the police for searching, meaning that his remains have never been found. After the searches, Annette Swanson, Brandon's mother, was still bothered by the initial response of the Lind police, specifically the fact that they told her that her son had a right to be missing. She's quoted as saying, I'm his mother, and I knew something was horribly wrong. She and Brian Swanson began lobbying for changes in state law that would require an investigation into the case of a missing adult to begin as soon as it's reported. In 2009, Brandon's law was signed, making it so that police were no longer allowed to refuse a report based on their belief that no criminal activity was involved. The length of the time since the person was last seen, the possibility that the person had run away intentionally, or the lack of a relationship between the missing person and the person reporting them as missing. Brandon's parents knew at this point that the passing of this law wouldn't help in their son's case, but they hoped that it could make a world of difference in other cases in the future. On the morning of June 13th, 2001, the phone rang at the Jokowski residence on 48th and Bedford Street in Omaha, Nebraska. 19-year-old Jason Jokowski answered the call from his boss, who asked if he could come in to work early. Jason, whose car was getting repaired at the time, said he would find a ride and call back soon. This decision marked the beginning of an unsolved disappearance that has left many searching for answers. Jason Jolkowski, born on June 24th, 4th, 1981, in Grand Island, Nebraska, to Kelly Murphy and Jim Jolkowski, had a learning disability related to speech and language. Despite this, he was known for his higher-than-average intelligence and extensive sports trivia knowledge. His mother, Kelly, described him as a walking sports trivia dictionary. Jason was shy, quiet, and close to his family. He was not involved with drugs or alcohol and had a very small circle of friends. At 19, Jason stood at 6 foot 1 inch tall, weighed around 165 pounds, and had brown hair and brown eyes. After graduating from Benson High School, he worked part-time at Fazoli's Restaurant while he attended Iowa Western Community College. Despite his speech and comprehension challenges, Jason surprised his family by majoring in radio broadcasting. He developed his radio personality while hosting the college radio station, becoming a different person while he was on air. Jason was excited to start a new job at a local radio radio station in late June 2001, but a single phone call changed everything. On June 13th, 2001, Jason answered his call from his boss at Fazoli's, asking him to come in early. Without his car, Jason arranged to meet a co-worker at Benson High School, eight blocks from his home for a ride. He was seen by both his brother Michael and a neighbor taking out the garbage and heading to the school wearing his red Fazoli's t-shirt. By 11.15 a.m., his co-worker became worried when Jason didn't show up and called the Jolkowski residence from a nearby gas station. Michael, initially pretending to be Jason, quickly realized the concern and confirmed Jason had left over half an hour ago. Jason's co-worker then called their boss and returned to work. Jason has not been seen since. His family reported him missing 24 hours later, but police didn't open a formal investigation until 10 days after his disappearance, possibly missing crucial evidence. 
During the investigation, police interviewed Jason's co-worker and cleared her of involvement. Security footage from Benson High School confirmed that Jason never arrived. Nothing seemed unusual before Jason's disappearance. He left behind $650 in his bank account, and his car, cell phone, and ATM card were never used again. His final paychecks from Fazoli's remain uncashed. Several theories about Jason's disappearance have emerged over the years. One theory suggests Jason was the victim of a hit-and-run accident while walking to the school. It's possible that the motorist could have either taken Jason to a hospital or disposed of his body in a panic. However, However, no witnesses reported such an incident and police found no evidence. This combined with the fact that it was the middle of the day makes this theory highly unlikely. Another theory is that Jason either took his own life or ran away, but both lack substantial evidence. Jason was excited about his future job. He had strong religious beliefs and showed no signs of depression. His family severely doubts that he would have put them through such trauma. The most plausible theory at this point is that Jason was abducted, possibly by someone he knew. Jason may have accepted a ride from a familiar face while walking to the high school. His family and law enforcement believe he was likely met with foul play. Although multiple sex offenders in the area were interviewed and one's home was even searched, no evidence linked any of them to Jason's disappearance. Jason Dolkowski's disappearance has baffled investigators and internet sleuths for over 20 years. His parents founded Project Jason, a nonprofit organization that raises awareness for missing person cases and supports affected families. In 2005, Nebraska passed Jason's Law, establishing a statewide missing persons data database. Kelly Jolkowski, Jason's mother, has received multiple awards for her advocacy work. Not a single one of the cases in this video have been solved to this day. If you have any more information about these cases that I may have missed, or theories that you believe could explain these disappearances, please share them in the comments. If you've made it this far in the video, I want to personally thank you for your support. We recently hit a thousand subscribers, and I am incredibly blessed for each and every one of you that have taken the time to support this channel. Every single like, comment, and subscription means the world to me. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.